Good morning, everyone. We're happy to have with us this morning Under Secretary Robert D. Hormat, who will be speaking today with you on several issues, the main one being wildlife trafficking and the concern the U.S. has over the proliferation of this illegal activity in the last decade. Under Secretary Hormat is here in Tokyo visiting for the IMF World Bank Conference. He will start off with a brief statement, and then we will take your questions um, in order as you queue up on the system. Please press 9-1 if you have a question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, and I want to uh, express my appreciation for everyone who has uh, uh, agreed to participate in this uh, event. Uh, I'm really glad we've had a chance to, to uh, engage on this issue, and I'm looking forward to your questions. So in order to allow time for your questions, I thought I would just go through very quickly some of the reasons uh, for our intense interest in addressing illegal trade in wildlife. Um, first of all, let me just make the point that it is uh, not just an isolated problem. More and more, uh, we're hearing examples around the world of massive slaughters of wildlife, um, rhinos in uh, southern Africa, elephants in Cameroon and in Gabon and in southern Africa as well, killing tigers uh, for tiger bones that are used for various uh, types of alleged remedies. Uh, and the amounts are very large. I mean, the illegal trade in wildlife it amounts to billions and billions of dollars. We're not talking about small uh, amounts of trade uh, in, in these areas. And you know, after illegal trade in drugs and arms, it's the third biggest source of illegal trade. And uh, there's great evidence that is connected to um, international crime syndicates uh, because you need a very uh, highly developed infrastructure to get um, these uh, ivory tusks or um, tiger rhino horns or tiger parts or uh, other animal products from Africa where most of it comes from, although not only that, India and uh, Southeast Asia as well, to the major markets. Now, the major markets are all around the world. It's not just uh, one or two countries. There's a legal trade in uh, wildlife in, that goes to uh, destination points all around the world. The biggest destination points uh, are China and, and Vietnam, but they're not the only countries. And so our goal here is not to confront any one country, but to develop a collective team approach to addressing this, where all countries uh, have a stake in this, and all countries work together. We were able at the recent meeting of APEC in Vladivostok to reach an agreement on very, very strong language among all the countries of APEC to combat illegal trade in wildlife, and I think that was a very important part of the, of the process. Um, the United States has been supporting um, uh, a variety of uh, methods of addressing this, including regional wildlife enforcement networks, which we call WINS, raising public awareness and coordinating technical assistance with donors and recipient countries. Uh, the four areas that we're focusing on in particular are catalyzing political will and diplomatic outreach, which we're doing in APEC and many other uh, institutions as well, encouraging um, and supporting public diplomacy and outreach so that people realize what a terrible thing it is to buy uh, ivory products and other things that come from uh, slaughtered elephants or utilizing such things as um, rhino horn, powdered rhino horn for allegedly uh, medical types of, of cures like uh, some people argue it's a cure for cancer, which it most certainly is not. No doctor in the world would, uh, would say that it is. And in fact, I published a blog, and I had the head of the American uh, National Cancer Institute, uh, Harold Varmus, who said emphatically, this guy won the Nobel Prize for study in cancer research, that there is no uh, evidence at all for rhino horn curing cancer, or any other disease for that matter. So we're trying to uh, engage public diplomacy. I want to make the point, it's not that we're against traditional 
Asian or traditional Chinese medicines. Many of them are very good and very effective, but utilizing tiger parts or rhino horns or other things, there's no evidence that they cure anything. They cost a lot of money and they uh, lead to no results uh, except the killing of animals, certainly no medical benefits. The third is to identify prospects for training um, and uh, various types of technological uh, capability uh, for wildlife rangers or other things so that it would help them do their jobs more effectively. And lastly, building on existing partnerships and instituting new cooperation to improve enforcement capability through groups like these um, uh, wildlife uh, enforcement networks, um, which we're doing in ASEAN, USAID, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have been working with other countries to help them with respect to their capacities. We have a variety of other groups where we're working together with countries of the region in order to address illegal trade in wildlife. So this is just a few, uh, these are just a few introductory remarks. Um, and just to conclude that again, this is a, a, a growing problem. The amounts of money uh, in illegal wildlife trade range in the, in the five to seven billion dollars worth, which is a lot. These are estimates, and it's very hard to document precise amounts, but it's certainly huge, and uh, it's very closely connected to organized crime, and um, this is something that we think all countries have an interest in working together with us. I was in South Africa very recently, and um, the, uh, the South Africans were pleading for help uh, saying that, you know, they're outgunned, uh, these, these uh, poachers use uh, automatic weapons, and helicopters, same thing happened in, um, in uh, Chad very recently and in, um, and in Cameroon where there's a huge amount of poaching. So uh, this is something that really permeates uh, the whole region. Kenya um, has suffered, uh, the Kenya Wildlife Service alone has uh, seen a number of its forest rangers, 15 of them altogether killed in the last year. So this is a very serious problem and this is something we're uh, emphasizing uh, to a very substantial degree and we want to work with other countries in this region in a cooperative way to address the problem. And uh, as I say, it's not aimed at any one country, it's aimed at uh, developing a coalition of a number of countries uh, that um, will work together to address this problem in a constructive way. And we've gotten some cooperation, considerable amount of cooperation from countries in APEC already, and we want to develop um, more cooperation as we go over the next several weeks and months. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Mr. Under Secretary. With that, we will take your questions. Again, please press 9-1 on your handset so that we'll know who's uh, queuing up and we can unmute you on our end. Thank you. First question will be from the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong. Yeah, this is Greg Tarode from the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong. Um, Under Secretary, uh, you said several times that this is not targeting any one country. I wonder if you're anticipating um, a little sensitivity from Beijing on this issue. Um, Obviously, you identified them as one of the major markets. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I think that they are certainly a major market. They're the biggest market. I mean, just uh, by any statistical measure, China is the biggest market for um, the rhino horns and for uh, ivory uh, products of various sorts. But as I say, they're not the only one. And I was very... Uh, very um, impressed with the uh, support that we got from China in um, the conversations we had in Vladivostok at APEC, where the Chinese signed on to this uh, resolution that the uh, heads of state agreed to. So our aim is to work with the Chinese in this uh, to help strengthen their enforcement 
capability, help them to get the word out to uh, Chinese citizens that uh, these products are um, available uh, in, in, at the expense of, of killing wildlife around the world. This is a country, China, that wants to strengthen its ties with Africa, among other countries, and therefore, uh, given the strength of feeling among Africans about the fact that killing these uh, the wildlife of Africa robs their people of their national patrimony, and that the that the uh, poachers really are a national security problem for these countries because they undermine the ability of of governments to govern in certain areas because these poachers pay. Uh, illegal traffickers lost lots of money, they undermine stability in various regions. So we think the Chinese have a very strong interest, one, to protect their own citizens from things like um, fake drugs that are alleged to cure cancer and other things and really don't, that they also have an interest because they're uh, participants in international conventions to protect these animals, that they have an interest in adhering to those conventions. Three, that they have an interest in ad addressing uh, this syndicated international crime, which is the, uh, is the way a lot of the money and the products are moved around. And that uh, four, um, as part of APEC and other groups, um, they should have an interest in, in, working, in working with us. And, we we want to we want to engage them in a constructive way, and we've seen some evidence that they're willing to move in that in that direction. So uh, I I do think while they're the biggest market, they're also a country that if they work collectively with the Africans and other countries in the region, can have the biggest impact on stopping this. And if you stop uh, the demand or dramatically curtail the demand then the poachers don't have the revenues to keep up uh, their, uh, their supply networks or to buy uh, armaments or to pay off uh, uh, corrupt border officials. So we think that working with China is really one of the keys to this and hope we can continue to do that. Thanks. Sure. The next question will be from Vietnam from Toy Trey Newspaper. And if you're online, go ahead and proceed with your question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I am Hung Zhang from Sui Xie. Um, I have a question concerning the situation in Vietnam. You mentioned that Vietnam is considered as a main destination for illegal trading of especially rhino horns. And there is one fact that everyone knows. Most of those products that are illegally imported to Vietnam are, again, illegally exported to China. So... What do you think uh, that can be done to stop it? Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, some of it is used in Vietnam, and some of it, as you say, is sent to China. Where it, it, since it's illegally moved, it's very hard to know the exact amounts. But we know some some of it actually is used in Vietnam also. Uh, but as you correctly point out, uh, a, a large portion also is transshipped on to China. I think what can be done is education of the public in Vietnam about uh, the, the consequences of utilizing um, illegal wildlife, about the harm that's done to uh, illegal wildlife and the environment in many parts of the world as a result of these poachers, primarily in Africa, but also some of it comes from the Indian subcontinent as well, uh, helping Vietnam to strengthen its enforcement capabilities and its laws to prevent the sale and the transmission of illegal wildlife. All these things are things that we would like to work with, um, with, uh, with the government of Vietnam on. We have had seminars that have been held in Bangkok uh, where we've had Vietnamese and Thai and Cambodians and others participate and we want to continue to do that. We have good technical assistance programs, which we're willing, through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Agency and through the U.S. Uh, AID and other groups, are willing and eager to work with the authorities in Vietnam to have tougher enforcement, tougher rules, 
and help Vietnam to curb the domestic use of this and to curb and eliminate the transmission of these uh, of, of these products. Thank you. Thank you. Next question will be from the 21st Century Business Herald in Beijing. If you're on the line, please feel free to ask your question. Thank you. This is Jiang Wei from 21st Century Business Herald in China. I have two questions. One is about the IMF governance and the quota reform, uh, which will give more voting power to emerging economies like China. The deal in 2010 is supposed to come into force this week in Tokyo, but actually it is dead locked now. So what's your comment? And uh, when do you expect the reform can be done? And my second question is about the fiscal cliff. Since the U.S. faces major risks related to the spending cuts and also tax increase, so are you uh, are you worried like the U.S. economy may fall back into recession? What will be your solution? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for those questions. Uh, on the question of the IMF voting, um, this is an item that is been discussed, will continue to be discussed. I don't think I have anything new to add on, on the question of vote, of what's known as voice and vote in the IMF, and that's really handled by the Treasury Department in the United States rather than the State Department. On the second point about the, um, the U.S. economy, I, I know there's uh, a lot of interest in this in China and elsewhere in this region. Um, because of the importance of the American economy uh, to the global economy and certainly to, to China and other um, countries that trade with the United States and have strong financial ties to the United States. I, I think that there is a growing uh, sense in the United States on, uh, in, in both parties um, that something needs to be done to address these financial issues uh, and be done very soon. The probability is that there will be a very intense discussion of this issue as soon as the elections have taken place, which will be in um, the middle part of November and through December. There is a great deal of importance attached to this by, I think, both political parties and I do think there is a good chance that a consensus can be reached to avoid a, uh, a major problem occurring. And this, this is going to take uh, bipartisan compromise. It's going to take a lot of work. But a lot of conversations have already taken place between our two political parties on this. I think each knows the other's position. Uh, now it's an opportunity for them to develop a compromise within the Congress and uh, working with the White House to, um, to identify ways of avoiding a, uh, a serious uh, fiscal problem. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that there is a growing will on the part of all parties to move ahead and develop a, uh, a consensus. Now the, the hard work will have to be done after the election in order to make uh, a, uh, this growing consensus into actual policy decisions which avoid the problem. Thank you for your question. The next question will be from Singapore, from the Business Times Singapore. If you're online, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, um, um, Mr. Holmes. Um, I have to finish about the um, ongoing IMS World Bank meeting. Uh, yesterday, uh, Christine Lagarde said that the Austerity measures that uh, European officials are pushing could uh, produce an opposite effect on uh, struggling countries like Greece and Spain. So what's your take on this? And is austerity still the solution to Europe's problems? Well, uh, you know, I, I think getting into these conversations that she's had um, probably not be a very good idea. She just made this announcement yesterday. There are going to be a lot of conversations here over the next couple of days in this question. So I think I'll just let her and the other countries that are involved uh, discuss these issues. I think for the United States to get engaged in this 
discussion between the IMF and the Republicans is probably not a very good idea, so I'll just uh, pass on that question and let the IMF and the Europeans speak for themselves on, on their various points of view. It's a very good question, but it's not one I'm able to answer, or should answer for that matter, or try to answer. Thank you for your question. The next question will be from China, Beijing, the National Economic You're online. Go ahead and ask your question. Uh, good morning, Ms. Thomas. Um, my good morning. Is, it, there are two questions. The first one is that the trade uh, frictions between the United States and China are increasing. For example, the United States is called anti-dumping and anti-subsidy uh, tax on Chinese uh, solar products and investigate the Huawei technologies and ZTE Chinese companies. Is it a kind of trade protectionism and how well these uh, uh, imply for the Chinese enterprises that want to go into the American market? And the second question is that uh, after the United States election, will there be a great shift of the uh, U.S. policy towards China and how do you cross for the I know you asked that I should say. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. On the first um, question, um, it's, it's certainly true that there are from time to time trade issues between our two countries, and the solar issue is one of those, um, one of those issues. Um, but, you know, I think by and large, while there are certain issues, we we believe that um, where we do have trade issues with the Chinese, um, they should be taken up in the context of the rules of the World Trade Organization, and we have attempted to do that on this solar panel issue. Um, we think that the framework of rules and obligations and norms under the WTO is the right vehicle for resolving these kinds of issues. We do not want a trade war with China. We don't think China wants a trade war with the United States. Our two economies are very closely interlinked. And the interesting thing is that given the huge amount of trade between our two countries, there are trade issues that go to the WTO, but they involve a relatively small amount of trade given the very large amount of trade that goes on. And it's, it's true with a lot of countries that have a lot of trade that they're always going to be trade frictions, and the key is to work them out in a way which is consistent with international rules and international norms under the under the um, under the framework of the WTO. The second um, the second point is after the election relations between the United States and China. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that's been very um, positive about the relationship between our two countries is that there's been a strong bipartisan consensus in the United States, and I think there's been a strong consensus among leaders in China that our two countries need to work together on economic issues. There's, there are clearly some very challenging issues between our two countries. Uh, I don't want to underestimate those issues. They are uh, we have real concerns about intellectual property protection in China. We have real concerns about the uh, piracy of uh, trade secrets by uh, of American companies um, in China that we think are very harmful to uh, American companies. We have concerns that certain uh, sectors of the Chinese, econ uh, Chinese economy are restricted uh, with respect to the ability of foreign companies to invest in those um, in those sectors, which gives them uh, a competitive advantage because they don't have foreign companies investing in those sectors, which which enables Chinese companies to operate in a more or less protected way. We're, we have concerns about an unlevel playing field and uh, certain advantages that are given state enterprises or state-supported enterprises, which gives them a uh, competitive, artificial competitive advantage. We don't have objections to state enterprises, per se. We have objections to policies that give state enterprises 
an artificial competitive advantage through uh, preferential financing, through uh, advantages such as free land or cheap energy or protection from um, any trust laws, things of that sort. So we have a lot of issues with China. Um, and um, But we're trying to resolve these in a constructive way through discussions like uh, the strategic and economic dialogue and other uh, other vehicles. I'm going to be meeting with Chinese officials uh, here tomorrow in um, in Tokyo to discuss some of these issues. So we clearly want to work with the Chinese government. We also know that there are a number of elements of the 12 five-year plan and the uh, document that was worked out called China 2030, where there are a number of things that China wants to do that are, uh, that are consistent with the kind of things that we think will help to strengthen U.S.-China relations. Um, China wants to increase value-added investment. That means China needs to protect intellectual property because that's how you get high value-added investment. China wants to engage in a going-out policy for its companies. Um, if it wants its companies to achieve um, greater acceptability in international markets, it's got to demonstrate that those companies are operating on the basis of commercial principles and commercial objectives, which means that there shouldn't be as much government support for some of these companies. So we think there are a lot of opportunities. And also, just let me say that we're, we, we're encouraging Chinese investment in the U.S., and while there are certain examples of concerns about certain investments, there are six, roughly 600 Chinese investments in the U.S., and the amount's been going up. So we, we obviously have concerns if there are national security issues raised by Chinese investment. Uh, we have a process for addressing that, but most Chinese investment in the U.S. does not uh, raise national security considerations. And large numbers of investments have actually taken place in, in our country. So there is a lot of room for cooperation, uh, but there are also serious issues that we have, like intellectual property, that need to be uh, need to be addressed in a constructive way. Thank you, Mr. Undersecretary. Thank you for your time today. For those of you who took the time to participate, we appreciate you calling in, and we will make the audio of this interview available um, via online links, and we'll send that out to you once we have it available. Again, thank you, Mr. Secretary, and goodbye to all.